Uh, but I'd like to introduce Esther first. And Esther, you've done some amazing things. Um, you've been a producer uh, with award-winning Revolution School for ABC One. Uh, yeah. Uh, Logie nominated Last Chance Saloon. Um, your goal is to bring intimate stories to life with insight and humour. Uh, you're a veteran of development. Uh, thrives with the challenge of turning an exciting idea into a successful TV series. And some of your success stories include Lukewarm Sex, Secrets of Our Suburbs, and House of Food Obsessives. They all sound extremely tantalising titles there. Um, you've, done, you've got two decades of program making. You like coaching and mentoring people in and outside the media industry. And you've helped people kickstart their projects and revamp, restart or change careers. So that's, I think this is such a timely, I know you're, uh, you and Denise are doing media mentors this afternoon. Yes. So timely with all the changes that are happening at the moment. And you're driven that you love working. And given how much of our lives most of us spend at work, that we need to do something that meets our needs. So it sounds like uh, you're a real go-getter there. <laughs> I love I love people's biographies. We all we all sound so fabulous. Like we miss we miss the realities, the little intimate parts of our lives. But we sound great. Um, thanks for that introduction, Sue. Um, welcome to everyone. Welcome Nick. Welcome Owen. Um, what I wanted to do, I'm going to first of all tell you a little bit about this session. So we're going to talk about film, and by film this occasion we are talking about all video content so that could be tv big features online content um australia produced the world's first tiktok drama this year mm. um so really film can mean anything at all and specifically we're going to look at how freelancers are going to be affected over the next kind of few years and what growth areas are going to be so we're not going to be doom and gloom like oh my goodness we'll never make a film again we'll keep it positive now if you've got any questions for any of us or you want a bit more information please um please put something up on the chat or the q a we're happy to keep an eye on both so first of all, I'm going to start off by doing a brief introduction for our fantastic panellists. So Nick, Nick truly embodies what it is to be a freelancer, I think. He has done so much in his career. He's been a film director, an event organiser, a teacher, a film critic, a theatre reviewer, and he loves a bit of dance. I, I think that you absolutely personify what it is to be a freelancer and to embrace all the opportunities that we can we can get so thank you nick for coming and joining us thank you esther um, and welcome owen so Hello. owen is the festival director of the breath of fresh air festival and the aim of that festival is to inspire change personally in your community and in in the world and we'll talk a bit more in depth about the breath of fresh air festival in a few minutes we've got a, a specific section about film festivals and i am i i was going to let owen do this boast but I, i'm going to do it for him which is about the fact that your festival was the very first festival in 2020 <laughs> to go online <laughs> What what an amazing what an amazing achievement, Owen! You must have been so proud to embrace that change. Look, I have to give credit to my uh, daughter Bronwyn, who said to me when we had to close down the physical festival, "Why don't you take it online, Dad?" I said, "Oh, I don't want another challenge. Thank you very much." <laughs> but we did have the. Uh, the, the lineup pretty much lined up and we went back to our distributors and two thirds of the distributors said they'd play the game because it's a bit of a novel thing for them to allow their films to be streamed. Uh, and uh, we turned it around in about three weeks, uh, which is a, a tribute to you know our team and uh, to the, the willingness of people to try something new. So yeah, we were very proud. Thank you. That's, it is amazing. Um, prior, prior to that, you've been a business consultant and worked in the community and developed a community-led partnerships program so what we're going to do we couldn't talk about the future without mentioning the present so the impact of covid 
Now, I was on a panel last week with TV commissioners from most of the major networks, and it's the reality is COVID has had a massive impact on budgets, um, which is likely to continue over the next couple of years. Um, what other impacts have COVID had, both good and bad, to the freelancing film world? And, um, Nick, I'll start with you. Um, look, um, COVID has stopped, basically stopped most production in Australia. So about 100 productions have um, stopped. However, um, let's, let's get into the good news. Um, there are productions still going. Neighbours has started back in May, um, which is great because that's a stable of Australian TV, um, free to air. Um, uh, also, there was a production that was um, another remake of Stephen King's, um, uh, what was it called? Um, uh, Children of the Corn um, uh, being uh, filmed outside of Sydney that um, continued through the, co uh, the pandemic and they had a little uh, book of conduct which allowed them to actually process, uh, uh, make the film and they ju they've just finished uh, principal photography. Now, the interesting thing is they had insurance and um, uh, and with that insurance, they were able to do that film. And most films, particularly those large budgets, that was a $6 million film employing about nearly 500 people. They had, um, they had insurance. Now, sadly, the insurance companies won't fund films during this pandemic, which makes it very difficult to get a film up because you need that insurance. If things go wrong, for whatever reason, we're talking a lot of money. That's at the top end. Um, still need that for the uh, smaller um, productions as well and for obviously things like attachments so for freelancers who want to attach themselves to production that's a really important thing to have insurance um, the other thing that's happening um, and I've gone I'm sliding back into the negative is at the moment and it could be a positive at the moment there's an option paper um, looking at Australian content as you know um, a lot of the Australian content quotas for free to air have stopped um, for six months um, so that the the, um, the Australian free-to-air um, TV stations don't have to produce Australian content. Now, there's an option paper now to look at this uh, situation, but more in particular, the fact that streaming services don't have to have Australian content, and that is a growing industry. So um, this is a period of a change. Times are changing. That's both, a, a, you know, they talk about threats and opportunity. This is, we're in it. We're in it. I Absolutely, we are totally in it. There is, I think, the other thing to mention in terms of the good news is because Australia has managed COVID remarkably well compared to America and the US uh -huh. uh, and the UK, actually, there are a number of international productions who are looking at ways of coming over here. So I think there are going to be opportunities even even amongst that, though, you know, probably not in Victoria at the moment. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. No, no, it's a great opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. That is, and we've, we've, we're leading the way in terms of um, COVID um, precautions and code of conducts and so forth. Yeah, brilliant. And yeah. Owen, what... what do, happen, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> and Owen, what about um, your experience with the um, film festival? To, I mean, obviously it gave you a great opportunity. Do you think that the, that will, those kind of opportunities will continue for, for us? Look, it's a, it's a good question because I spent yesterday writing the first draft of our business plan for 2021. And uh, we did a, a major survey of uh, our audience uh, at the end of the festival, which ran in May. And the interesting statistics uh, were that, I mean, Tasmania's got a population of 500,000 people. Uh, we had a festival that would attract seven and, a, seven and a half thousand people, both out of Hobart and Launceston, which is, you know, creditable, but not huge. Uh, by going online, we ended up with a festival audience of 27 and a half thousand people. Uh, wow. And the wow, that's huge. It is huge. And uh, what it does is it turns us around from being a small festival competing with other major festivals on the mainland and elsewhere, uh, trying to get people to hop on a plane and come down to our film festival, because uh, Events Tasmania and Tourism Tasmania rate film festivals and, and this part of the arts 
on the number of people we can attract to the state rather than the things that we're trying to do, which are about creating positive change. But that's their money and uh, they can make the rules up anywhere they like. But by uh, going online, we actually reach out to an audience around Australia. And uh, what we're pitching to them is that uh, we effectively become another streaming channel, but one that's kind of owned by Tasmania because you mentioned the name of our festival, the Breath of Fresh Air Festival. In actual fact, it's called the Tasmanian Breath of Fresh Air Film Festival. Uh, and I'm not being rude to sort of correct you on that, but those two extra words are absolutely critical. We're about film. We're about using film and conversations and so on. Our title is Great Stories Together. Uh, and uh, the fact that we're Tasmanian gives us a, a bully pulpit, if you like, to sort of talk up Tasmania. So, for example, during... This last festival, we managed to help uh, raise uh, almost $10,000 for an, an arts organization uh, called Remade uh, by asking our uh, patrons of the online festival who didn't have to pay for it, it was a free festival. We said, look, if you've enjoyed it, give money to these other guys who are battling and who, who want to actually do something. The other interesting statistic is that um, what I think will happen uh, with the future is that online, actually gives an opportunity to those people who don't live in the cities. And uh, something like 27% of our audience of that 27 and a half thousand people were outside the metropolitan areas. Uh, and uh, the feedback we had for, as well from a, a lot of people was, yeah, we love to dress up and go to the movies. We love to dress them up and go to uh, festivals and so on. But gosh, it's nice to be able to pick a film when you want it and know it's been curated, so you don't have to trawl through, you know, 9,000 Netflix films and so on. Uh, but there's one that's been curated by people who've got a particular point of view. Uh, and you can sit there with your, your jammies on and a bottle of wine nearby and uh, your loved one or loved ones around you. Uh, so we think that the, the future uh, will be positive. I mean, human beings are amazingly adaptable. And uh, what we're pitching is that uh, we will have not only a physical festival, which there is still a demand for, because there's nothing like sitting in a darkened cinema with a bunch of other people, but we'll also have the online festival. So we'll, uh, a friend of mine used to have a, an acronym called Awanio, as well as not instead of. So we'll do both. That's really, that's such an interesting point, how we're going to go forward and have that mixture of online and um, in-person events so but I think that that sounds like not only do we have a positive impact for audiences because you can reach more people you can speak to people who would never get to see your film festival anyway but that you can also maybe attract content or for films from makers in a more global space is that is that something that you're considering very much so. I mean, the, the interesting thing will be, uh, Nick will tell you more about the distribution side and the technical side of the industry, but there's a number of distributors who will not give uh, content to us to put online because uh, they're concerned about it. It uh, dilutes their you know, cinema launches and premieres and that sort of thing. Uh, but by going online, we can actually give uh, uh, an avenue, a channel, to independent filmmakers, to overseas filmmakers who don't have distributors in this uh, country, uh, but also by having the physical film festival, we can get those films which are acceptable to the big distributors, which are shown in a film uh, cinema uh, with DCP uh, projection, uh, which is the multiplex grade uh, projection. So you're getting the best of both. And uh, I'm very positive that uh, good things will come out. Uh, for example, uh, we were talking to Tourism Tasmania at the end of, uh, or just before uh, COVID made us pull the plug. And we were planning to do a national Stories of Tasmania uh, competition. And you as a, a filmmaker yourself, and you've obviously made some shorts, uh, we were asking, uh, going to ask people to make shorts in three minutes uh, about Tasmania, but preferably narratives rather than pretty pictures of mountains and so on. Uh, and three minutes doesn't sound like a lot of time to most people, but you can do an amazing job uh, in three minutes. Uh, people have even done film, good films in, in one minute and so on. And that way is a, another channel to get stories of Tasmania out to the, the wider world. So we're feeling pretty positive about the whole thing. The online festival will remain free, 
So then it comes down to our ability to convince not only government, but also corporate sponsors, because we, we get anywhere between a third and a half of our sponsorship support comes from corporations who want to be seen uh, to being a good force in the world and also uh, wanting to get the message about Tasmania out. Excellent. Thank you. Now, the other issue that's kind of been laid bare by 2020 is diversity. So, I, you know, let's acknowledge the white elephant in the very white room with our very white panel. Um, I'm hoping very much that the future of film will bring about a better representation of people. So, Nick, how do you think that diversity will impact freelance work? Um, look, it, uh, anything to do with diversity opens up film and films always, gen generally films, as we talk about feature films, have, have often led the way, I guess, in um, breaking a lot of stereotypes, bringing uh, stories of um, various um, social, political um, um, and cultural kind of um, uh, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Stories, it, uh, drama. Sorry, to the screen. Um, television has certainly now caught up, and the fact that we've got online um, services that allow at least the de democratization of ideas. Um, whether you're making money or not, that's another that's another question, particularly for freelancers. Um, and there are there are ways to do it, um, but it's all hard work. Now. The thing there that I I, 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 I will always stress is that um, um, it, film um, generally um, has always been um, a, a, a medium for getting these stories across and for having impact, both positive and negative. Um, I can think of, at the moment, Netflix has got 365, which is um, having some controversy because of the rape scenes and the uh, the kind of sexual assault in that particular film, so that's. Um, but you're going to get that as well as transgender films. They're going to um, help in um, particularly young people identifying themselves on the screen, and 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 film. Um, always serves as a reflection of reality. It isn't reality, but it really helps us in terms of finding out who we are. In terms of the people working, um, look, in industry, I'm, I'm noticing certainly um, in Australian um, television that there is um, um, more, uh, you, you look at the names on, an, uh, on a, um, on a crew list, you'll see a lot of people from different backgrounds working on films. Those people are going to make those new products. They're going to bring other cultures to it. I, I know that, like, going back a little bit, and it's probably not a, poli a politically correct film, but uh, TV series, Fat Pizza, I remember poor Fennec knocking and knocking on, banging on SBS's door to try and get that up. And he basically started it making it on a shoestring and it went for five seasons. So there was an audience there. Um, whether you like it or not, doesn't matter, but it was, it got up. So look, my, my thing is we are becoming, Australia is in a very good position. We are a, a multicultural society. So we do see stories. I'm a, I'm a son of a migrant, uh, Italian parents. Um, I didn't even know what um, Italian identity was until I saw, uh, you know, when I realised that we could make fun of Italian identity until I saw Mark Mitchell do Con the Frutera. And that's in the 90s. And, you know, I grew up in the 60s. Um, there was very few Italian, even then, I think the only film I can think of is there, A Weird Mob, that at least had Italians in it, you know, in a kind of a reasonable depiction. Otherwise, you had to go to foreign films. And SBS was created that to open up Australia to multi, the multicultural place we are. Thanks. Now, I've got a question from uh, Corinne. Netflix has also made Homemade, uh, a series of films made during lockdown. She would love to hear what either of you or both of you thought of it if you've seen it. I can't comment because I haven't seen it. So um, I do apologise, but I haven't. <laughs> Owen, Owen, have you watched, been able to catch it yet? Fortunately not. Uh, there's so much to see out there. Oh. We're, we're drowning in content. <laughs> we sure. I'm so sorry, Corinne. Um, and yeah, look, apologies. The, yeah. Now, you Can did... I come back to that issue about uh, diversity, though? D Pardon? Did I come back to the issue about... Yes, it? that was exactly where we were. You, you were headed that way. Uh, look, everything Nick says is correct, but um, the power dynamic still resides in the hands of you know powerful men 
in particular and powerful institutions who trust men uh, more than women in this industry because it, uh, especially at the, the better end, uh, the big budgets, uh, women are, are grossly underrepresented. Overall, 33% of uh, directors are female, 37% uh, of producers are female, which is interesting because the producers, as you know, call the shots uh, in many ways. The directors get the, the kudos, but the, the producers make it all happen. Uh, and what you see is that there's a, a big representation of women in the independent and the smaller budget films. But once you start to go up there with the big bucks on the table, uh, for whatever reasons, the patriarchy or uh, uh, banks that are sensitive or funding bodies that are sensitive about it, certainly women are underrepresented. And I said earlier that uh, our festival tries to address positive change. We aim for at least 50% uh, of female directors uh, in what we do. And in the last few years, we've had sections we, we run on themes. Uh, so we have had a theme of strong women uh, in recent years. And uh, the first year we did that, we had 60% of our uh, filmmakers were, uh, were female directors. Uh, but it's a challenge. And at the end of the day, if you want to run a quality uh, business and a, a quality film festival, you've got to pick the films that actually fit the themes and are actually uh, the quality that you want out there. So I don't see any quick fix, but I do think that the fragmentation of the film industry means that there are an enormous number of opportunities and niches for the smart females who actually don't want to play the game by the way the big boys play it and get out there and do their own thing. And the big issue is money. Uh, it's all about being creative. There's a lot of creative people, male and female, but the money is what makes it talk. And uh, I would suggest that uh, any females uh, watching this start to think about how can we get our hands on the bucks? How can we consolidate the outrage that a lot of women feel about the way the world goes these days and put some dollars behind that so that you've got the impact and the audience to actually get your messages out? Thank you. That's a, that's a really insightful answer, I, in, from my opinion. And I think that it's hugely important for those of us who are organising events to try and ensure diversity of makers and representation while still holding that the content has to be good. Um, now, I've got another question from uh, Marcus. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer, ask the question, see who feels best placed to answer it. Do you think the notion of authorship, um, for those of you who need clarity on that, that's where a director kind of controls all elements of a film to follow their vision, has disappeared? Mm. Nick, over to you. Okay, look, um, that, um, the, the whole theory, it's an, a theory um, that was, um, came out of uh, uh, um, uh, Francis, uh, Francois Dufresne's um, um, uh, writing he was a, when he was a film reviewer. And he, he, he looked at Hitchcock and saw um, he, that Hitchcock had control of all the elements in the, in the film per se. Um, look, film... Even Hitchcock would acknowledge this, that film is a collaborative process. There's no way you can make a large film. Not to say um, you you can't be the total filmmaker. If you, I, I certainly started that way. I, did, I thought that when I was making my films when I was 17, that I had to be the director, the producer, the writer, the, uh, make the props. Um, that's the way I thought, because I grew up in the country, and that's the way I kind of approach film. And it took me a lot, a, a lot, a long time to work out. Oh, I've got a crew when I got into bigger things that actually can take that burden. Um, look, the um, yes, there's always um, the possibility, and certainly in in things like animation and smaller things, you can become an auteur. But um, that's a, certainly a personal thing for people to decide on whether I want to be a, an auteur or whether I want to gather um, a crew. Now, in the, as you get larger, you'll find you'll need to collaborate. In fact, that's really the way to go. And we're not talking about so much producers and directors and those kind of things. Today, we're talking about creators. Because of the cr so many platforms, as um, Owen has mentioned, um, um, we've got so many avenues. Now, the trick is to find the best uh, means um, that you can afford um, to make you, what you want to make um, and go for it. Um, you know, if, if, if it happens to be an iPhone and it's just yourself, fine. 
if 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 you but whatever you do you need to also think about who your end audience is and later we'll talk about exhibitors and distri distributors which is i think the bottleneck in the industry but um you've got to decide what kind of product you want to make who is going to see it whether it's just your family and friends or whether you want to show it to the world um, and certainly choose the best means available to you to to um, in terms of getting that um, uh, film across so whether you're an auteur or working in the community isn't really the point the point is getting what you want out there Lovely, lovely answer. I am going to add one teeny tiny bit to it because I met what I think of as a true author a couple of weeks ago. So he's a YouTube creator called Michael Shanks. He operates under the name Tim Tim Fed, and I'm going to pop that in the chat. Oh my goodness. He storyboards every single frame of his productions. And then you go and the team goes and recreates that. He's very clear. He has, he's not keen on collaboration. He directs it. He is involved in the production of it. He writes the music for it. He does visual effects. Like he blew my mind. He does get funded through Screen Australia. His film Rebooted is beautiful. But in order to do that, he, you know doesn't have he doesn't get paid much at all like he earns almost nothing and like nick said you've got to make a decision about the kind of career that you want and what what the purpose of your film is now we have got i'm gonna have to cut some of our questions because we've been chatting about other things so i'm gonna get nick i'm gonna challenge you to do a super quick answer <laughs> good luck <laughs> So, in the last 10 years, film has, filmmaking has been democratised. Kits affordable, available to all. Online tutorials can teach us, frankly, everything. What impact is this going to have on people who want to work professionally in film? Is it going to increase jobs? Is it going to open opportunities? And what skills should we be looking at developing? Look, um, I always believe that you should develop your skills no matter what, whether you do that going to a, you know, a particular film school um, or whether you, you know, form your own little cine club or you get a group of friends or group of colleagues and you create, um, you know, an organisation to make film. Um, look, uh, that kind of question that you mentioned isn't new. Um, the, the same kind of things were said about when video took over film. You know, suddenly we had something we could uh, actually see uh, the results straight away as opposed to sending film to a film lab and then waiting for it to come back. Um, certainly the amateur, in the amateur field, way back in, you know, the 60s, we had 8 mil, mil and even before then it was 16 mil was the amateur gauge. So people did have access, if you like, um, in the amateur field that was often then used professionally. So my, my thing is, I don't think... Um, it's going to um, concern um, professionals per se in terms of pursuing a professional career. I think that's it's going to be still wide open. It's about you know um, your, your ability and your passion to push and drive your project. Um, the thing that worries me most about that is you're going to get a lot of people um, who th may think that they have a product that you know can compete on the wheel stage. Um, and not understand what kind of skills or what kind of things may be, um, uh, uh, you know, important to get it onto, you know, um, a larger platform. Having said that, however, um, um, things like YouTube do um, allow for expression of all sorts of ideas, and there's a and 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 YouTube does have a huge audience, so you you will find your own audience. So it's it's about you know we're talking about whether you want to make money out of it or whether you want to show, you know, something that you're passionate about um, and they can be both together or they can be separate. So I don't think it makes a difference to the professional world. Mm. Great. Just as well as another career that hasn't been talked about and that is a film that has a, a social purpose. Uh, and there's a, a niche that I think would appeal to a lot of the people uh, who are uh, attending this freelance festival, which is called an impact producer. And uh, more and more films these days not only have a, 
uh, an executive producer and a, you know an overall producer and a, and a director and, and all the rest of the crew. But they have an impact producer who actually looks at how do we expand the impact uh, of this. Uh, Film's a bad word, actually. This screen product, I think, is a probably you know a clunkier sort of way of saying it. But anything that goes from anything from a blog all the way through to you know a big uh, cinema uh, production, uh, the reality is that if you want to get your film to have the resonance that it needs, you need to think about more than just getting it into a cinema and then maybe getting a few sort of uh, screenings around the place and then go to uh, video on demand or whatever. Uh, and the impact producers are the people who get schools involved, who uh, get campaigns behind it. There was a famous movie called uh, Bully some years ago that uh, came out of a, of a boy being uh, bullied in America, uh, led on to, you know, a thing about bullying generally that raised millions of dollars. Uh, you know, there's been other successful stories of getting the president of the United States, not the current one, mind you, but the, the previous one to actually, you know, make some changes in the military and so on and so forth. So. I would suggest that if anyone's interested in a career in film, uh, the impact producer is important, not only for getting the message out, but also you can get corporate sponsors who get behind your product because they want to see that message out there as well. And so you, you're bringing that money aspect back on the table. It's a, that's a really good point. I think one of Australia's best uh, directors of those films in recent years has been uh, Damon Gamow, with that sugar film and 2040. Um, I will share a link. Damon did actually a talk with, I did a talk with Damon about how to make a social impact film uh, for Acme. And it was, he was just fascinating in that. Now, we're gonna talk about the rise of the streaming services and YouTube and the fact that um, they do provide, you've both talked about niches and finding that audience. So very recently, um, a series called Flunk, which is an online teen drama um, telling an LGBTIQ story, uh, has found a massive global audience. It's incredibly niche and it wouldn't have, ha it wouldn't have found an audience large enough to make it financially viable in Australia alone. So. For both of you, how can we capitalise on those niche markets? Well, what I was just saying a moment ago, I think, is, is uh, very germane to that particular issue. Mm. In many ways, you know, people who want to get into film uh, or into the screen and, and come from a creativity point of view, they want to express their vision, they want to express their creativity and so on. Uh, in many ways, you need to take that and put it to one side and then ask yourself, what does the audience want? What is the gap out there? What is the message that will actually resonate with various people and then try and construct it backwards from there. Uh, and that's quite counterintuitive and a lot of creatives out there would be cringing uh, when they hear me say that. Uh, but the reality is it, uh, it's all very well to, to make something in your bedroom or in your garage for yourself and for your mates and for your family. Uh, but if you really do want to do something that leaves a mark and is a legacy for you and actually makes a, a difference in the world, you do need to start to think about those things. And there's the nice thing about streaming is everyone complains about the fragmentation, but fragmentation means opportunity because there is a, a market out there for just about everything. All you've got to do is go online uh, or onto the streaming content to find some weird and wonderful stuff and uh, find something that's your passion and uh, find the niche and then work backwards from what those folks are interested in and make something that's really powerful. Uh, excellent. Uh, Nick, have you got anything uh, to add to that? Um, um, in terms of um, niche markets, um, look, um, because of um, because of the kind of I guess the distribution model is slowly breaking down. Um, again, YouTube isn't necessarily a great money make, maker. So I'm thinking for freelancers who want to make money, um, it, you know, you, you've got ad revenue and you've got um, um, from various sources on television and YouTube. Um, you've got territory rights and all these kind of things, but they the distributors and exhibitors have a very strong 
um, stronghold and you really got to work hard to make money in these industries. However, as I said before, um, things like YouTube and, very, and various uh, streaming, you know, um, um, accessible um, um, mediums uh, uh, allow you to, um, to tell your story. Um, in ways that and reach a population, uh, reach an audience that you hadn't been able to do before. As um, Owen said, you know, you know, you may have made a film, but how the hell do I show this uh, beyond my friends and family? So I think the biggest question, and it'll come up again, is I, I, I can I'm concerned about the distribu distribution and exhibition part of the equation. It hasn't changed, and I think um, Owen um, talked about that old you know, that old um, kind of um, vanguard of um, the power brokers and mm. that, that, that's still there. Yeah, it really is. Now, we've only got a couple of moments left, so I'm going to very quickly, Nick, get you to touch on the new XR technologies, um, augmented reality, virtual reality. Is it complementary to our current filmmaking is it a bandwagon we should be jumping on or is it going to turn out to be the old Betamax? <laughs> um look it's uh, i definitely jump on it um uh, because um it, i think um um extended reality and obviously for people that encompasses you know virtual reality mixed reality and um, um augmented reality um yes they um I think uh, there's definitely um, there's a path ahead. Certainly, you know, I've seen um, mixed reality where you can actually engage with the virtual world. World, you, you've seen um, things like Mission Report, where you can actually uh, move things with your hands um, in a virtual world. So you actually um, actually physically kind of um, moving the virtual world. Uh, I think that has great potential for education because um, the mind-body kind of connection is really good. In film, um, we haven't, you know, they talk about the possibility of um, having actors in your room and you're engaging with them. That's still a little long, long way. There are two great films I must recommend to people to see. One is Simone, um, and this is about acting particularly for people who want to go into acting and uh, maybe a concern, but Simone is about um, um, uh, an actor that's a woman that's been created by Al Pacino and um, out of um, um, a digital, uh, she's a digital woman and she doesn't exist in real life and she becomes a success. And the other one is The Congress, which stars Robin Wright, um, who um, sells all her uh, rights um, as her young self in Princess Bride as she played the Buttercup to um, a screen, um, uh, to a screen producer. She sells all the rights. She's not allowed to act anymore. And they have a younger self of her. They've digitized, um, got all her emotions and they can create movies with it. That's the kind of possibilities we have in the future. Um, and um, good or bad, um, um, it's, a, it's really about embracing it. I don't think we'll ever lose the human element. Um, I think people will always say that, you know, there's a connection, but it's, it's food for thought. And I think embrace that technology. But one thing I will say is just because we have it, we don't necessarily need to use it. You know, just because we've created a new technology doesn't mean we have to use it all the time. So um, I still think some ethics and, um, and morale, um, morals about how you use it should be in place as well. Absolutely. Um, and also, I think it's worth mentioning about how good an adjunct it can be in terms of advertising um, and encouraging people to go and see a film. The, um, the latest film by Shane Jacobson, what they did is the weeks before the release of their film, they set up a little virtual reality booth in um, the cinemas and you could come along, put the glasses on and you could immerse yourself in a particularly emotional film, scene from the film. And what it did is it encouraged people to come back to the cinema the following week to see Shane Jacobson's film. So it's not replacing the old method of storytelling. It's about bringing an audience to it. Can I jump on to that one as well? Uh, I was speaking to a, a filmmaker the other day and uh, he said that he lives a portfolio life I said, what's that mean? He said, I do a bit of this and a bit of that uh, to make a living. And freelancers live the portfolio life every day. 
you get out of bed and you think what, you, what you're going to do next. Uh, but um, uh, augmented reality is a good example of that. Uh, I went to Tribeca, uh, my partner, Helen Tilbury, and I, I will say that uh, she and I run this festival jointly, uh, just to get that diversity issue out of the way. Uh, we went to Tribeca a couple of years ago and uh, they were talking about uh, uh, augmented reality and so on. And the only bloke who was actually making any money, and it was a bloke, uh, was a fellow who had a sports background and he was using um, that kind of technology to train people. And he came across the, the came out with the phrase, you know, to be good at something, it, it's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice that makes perfect. And with, uh, you know, the, the goggles on, you can replay and replay and replay until you actually build the sort of body reaction uh, to do these various things. And my feeling about the, the screen industry generally is that as it fragments, there's some people will rise to the top and make a lot of money and they're probably 2%, 5% of the total. The others have to think in a portfolio fashion and say, what are the technologies? What are the niches? What are the opportunities? to allow me to express my creativity on a day-to-day -day basis, but also to fund the fun bits and the creative things that I really want to do. So I'd recommend anybody who's uh, thinking of, you know, doing more in this area is don't think that life is linear. Uh, it is a portfolio and uh, look for the opportunities to actually bundle together a portfolio that makes you happy and, and also put some bread on your table. It's such a, that's such a great statement about the freelancer life within the film industry. Now, Esther, oh, sorry, yes. can I quickly say something about niche markets? I was, yes. I look, very quickly, uh, I'm worried about the time, but um, I was just thinking of um, team web series, for example, and I was just thinking of freelancers, how they might be able to make some money. And um, I, I think, you, you know, Flunk, um, the team web series um, in Australia, and, and it took them a long time to make some money. They still have a very small crew, um, they don't make a lot of money. Um, the ad revenue isn't that high. And so the way they're able to keep going, they've done 45 episodes, I think, um, is by keeping things small, keeping things tight, using the best equipment, so forth. Where um, I mean, Then you look at something like SCARM, a Norwegian teen series, which was very clever in the way it um, showed clips and then joined those together to make an episode that was shown on our equivalent of the ABC. And they sold format rights to that particular teen drama right across the world, number of European countries, the USA. And so they made their money that way. Um, but it, what, what amazes me very much like the Blair Witch Project, they used online resources in a very clever way to, to, to get, you know, noticed. And that's a big thing about, you know, you might start off on a, you know, very small, maybe home, even homemade kind of looking kind of web series or um, a film on uh, YouTube and suddenly it takes off and then you get interested in, a, in something that ha can, uh, someone who can offer you more money to make it a, a bigger pro project. So I just wanted to say that, that there's, there are opportunities. It's the way you approach it. I think, and I think that that sums up the, what you've both said, which is that there are opportunities you have to search for them. You have to be nimble. Portfolio has been a word that's banded around a lot. I think for freelancers, it's so important. We've got to be able to do more than just one thing. And now we've got one minute left. So, Owen, what's your big prediction for the future? It'll be variable. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Nick, can you compete with that in terms of brevity well, and insight? Well, I, all I'm going to say is I think um, film has been a sensory kind of experience and I think we're going to increase that experience certainly with the new um, um, uh, uh, new advances in neurology. So I'm going, to f I'm going to predict that in the future film will not just be you know, listening and, hear, um, and seeing, it'll be other sensations as well. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I won't go any further, but I think definitely um, uh, we, we're going to have more experiential stuff. And I think that's what people want. You seem to crave that. Good or bad. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you to um, all the attendees who came along and asked questions. And thank you, Sue, for letting me do this. Well, I could listen to that all day. That was just wonderful.
so yeah, we, we should have uh, longer um, to, yeah, it's just such a fascinating medium, isn't it? Because it is, it is evolving, has changed. I mean, it's just, particularly with the, the with VR um, coming into coming into it as well. And I, I've actually read about with VR, one of the things, one of the reasons why they're using it um, in particular, say for medicine and uh, the army and place like that is because it leaves the effect like a dream. And you know, when you wake up from a dream, uh, it's, it's, it's got that, that sort of, you know, you get a real feeling from it. Yeah. And they say that's why it's so powerful because it's bringing in all those emotions and that's what VR is doing as well. It, it leaves you like that dream state that you wake up, you know, thinking, oh my God, you know, you know, that was an amazing dream and it, it was so real and, and that's how it feels so, so real. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in that space. I have a final comment and just congratulate you on uh, taking the, the freelancer festival online. Uh, I think it's, I quite like Zoom. I know a lot of people don't, but uh, you get to look people in the eye uh, and you get uh, very strong and clear messages. Uh, you know, I was at Tribeca and was listening to some amazing Hollywood actors and so on, but I couldn't really see them because I was down the back and in the cheap seats. Uh, but uh, with uh, this online, I think this is not the way of the future, but it is one of the many ways of the future. And in our festival, we had a, an online uh, art uh, exhibition uh, and we had online conversations where we we're beaming people in from the United States and, uh, and Europe and so on uh, and uh, what you're doing and I think what we've been trying to do is one of the variations and the variables of the future and uh, I congratulate you on, on putting all of this together it's uh, amazing stuff well done Oh, thank you, Owen. It's always, always nice uh, to hear that. Yes, it, 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 I, I believe maybe it'll be a combination of both going forward. Like we might still be able to have some face-to-face -face events, yeah. but financially, you know, we don't know what's going to happen economically uh, over the next few, you know, the next few years. So I think if we can uh, join in this space and, and, and everyone, you know, we'll perfect it as, as time goes on, everybody gets better at, at the technologies and everything. So and some things work really well online. Some things actually work better online. So, yeah, I agree with you that um, moving forward, it's, it's an interesting space to watch. And imagine if we're all holograms, you know, <laughs> that technology is not too far away. So we'll all feel like we're sitting in each other's living rooms. Uh, that would be <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much. And Owen, um, you do a great job with your film festival. I think it's fantastic that you pivoted online as well this year. And you got so many, so many people, you know, coming to, it was, how many did you say you got all together? Seven and a half thousand and we're aiming for 30,000 plus. Uh, obviously we'll lose a lot of the COVID-19. Hopefully it'll be reverted somewhat more to normal next year. But I do think there's a niche out there for people who, who want to watch good films that have been curated in the comfort of their home. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you add around that, the whole bundle of, art exhibitions and conversations and various other bits and pieces. I, I think you can have texture. And the difference between what we're trying to do and, and what a Netflix tries to do is that we're a festival and that we have to keep that festival feel uh, of, you know, virtual drinks and, and, and all the rest of it and conversations between people uh, as much as possible. And that's the challenge for all of us and the challenge for you, I'm sure. And I think we will perfect all of that as time goes on too and people become more accepting of online conferences you know um thank you to all and esther thank you for those great questions and for keeping the conversation rolling that was that was a brilliant job and you're going to be back this afternoon and we're really looking forward to the two-hour workshop from media mentors with denise as well um, and there's skills audits and pictures how to do pictures and all sorts of things isn't there that you're oh. going to Present. Oh, oh yes, we are going to put people through their paces. This is not. This is a, you, everything for your freelance life. Find out what you're good at. Work out where your new markets are. Find out how to pitch yourself, and you know, create your online presence. Uh, we will keep. We will keep people on their toes for two hours. That's fantastic. I think we all need that because, you know, sitting in front of a computer, you can, you know, <laughs> this can be a little bit, you know, t too easy, can't it? So, yeah, make sure that uh, we get people's brains going. Um, not that it hasn't for this. Not that it hasn't for this. This was great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nick. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Esther. We're going to have you. a break until 11.20 and then we're coming back with our uh, platinum sponsor keynote. So, as I was saying before, Media Super will be presenting a keynote and what I'll do is share on my screen 
they've actually got a special offer as well where you can get in touch with Eric Black, who's going to be giving the keynote. Uh, he's the business manager at Media Super. And you can actually book him for a free appointment about your super, which I took the opportunity to do a couple of months ago. And he was able to, exp I've never been able to make any sense of superannuation statements. And Eric was able to show me, um, you know, why it's important um, to keep your savings up as a freelancer because you can get to the end of your career and have very little, little money in your account. So that's at 11.20. So go and have a break, everybody, again. You know, do some stretching, feed the dog, cat. Um, and we'll see you at 11.20. And thank you, panel. Very enjoyable. Thank you, thank you Esther. Thank, thank you, Owen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.